Just again. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. We continue in our series, picking up our reading from verse 35 to verse 41. Again, very familiar passage uh, with Jesus calming the storm. And yet, uh, this is the Word of God, and it is meant to excite us, cause us to rejoice in the Savior that the Lord sent into the world. And so let us, um, let us pray in our hearts that the Lord would uh, give us attentiveness, that we may hear Him speak to us. Mark 4, starting at verse 35. On the same day when evening had come, he, that is Jesus, said to them, his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Our hymn of preparation is number 181, Jehovah Sits Enthroned. It's based on Psalm 93. Let's rise to sing the four stanzas of number 181. If you're able to, I certainly invite you to keep your Bibles open to Mark chapter 4, verse 35 and following as we look at this passage this morning so we can follow along and uh, so I make comments on certain words and you can see it right in front of you. I always encourage that. Congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, many scholars believe, and I agree with them, that Mark's gospel is evangelistic. It has an evangelistic tone behind, him, behind it. Its, its goal is to evangelize, we might say. Now, it has other goals as well, but mostly, many scholars believe, and I believe with them, that it makes the case, mostly Mark's uh, gospel makes the case for believing in Jesus. It provides a record of the life, of the teachings, and the miracles of Jesus with the goal that his readers, and we think most, most likely non-Jewish readers who were not maybe as familiar with the Old Testament history, that they would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, they would come to believe in Him. Mark's gospel was meant to persuade the skeptical and strengthen the faithful. It answers questions like, who is this Jesus? Why should I believe in Jesus? 
What kind of a savior is this Jesus? Is he worth all my trouble believing in him? And these, of course, are still today vital questions that we personally have to ask ourselves and questions that we have to be ready to answer if anyone approaches us on these things, if we are called upon to, as Peter says, make a defense of the gospel, we, these are questions that we must be able to answer. Um, and the answer, of course, is very simple, and it's very powerful, and we see it here again in this passage. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Jesus is divine. We believe that God took on a flesh and blood body like ours, and he walked among us. And we've been seeing this in in, in, in his miracles of healing, his power over demonic beings, his authoritative teaching. And this morning we see him display divine power over the elements of nature in a way, in fact, that left his disciples terrified. This account sets before us again the supernatural power of Jesus. And it sets before us a Savior in whom we may trust. You know... Just one quick thing before we go forward. You know, the world today is flooded with fantasy and mythology. You have futuristic books and movies and television shows that keep coming out, uh, that, that, uh, that they keep churning out again and again, that portray people as, as uh, having, certain people as having powers or possessing rings or swords or hammers that have the, the ability to perform a, a magical things. And so much of that, because of the day and age we live in, and we're saturated with all this fantasy and mythology all the time on TV, on, on, uh, in movies, on, on, in books. So much of it, really, and, and maybe, this, maybe Satan has a part to play in, behind all of these things, but they have the tendency to kind of dull our senses to what is truly amazing. And so we come to a, an account like this this morning, and we say, yeah, yeah, we know all about that. It's not that big of a deal to us, because we're so saturated with, with fantasy and mythology in our day. And so let us at least for this moment, lay aside our thoughts that have been clouded with the force, you know, Star Wars, and Thor with his hammer to control the weather, and hobbits and all of these things, and let us learn this morning once again about a true superhero to the end that we might be able to confess with our mouths what we believe in our hearts, that Jesus is God and he is the only Savior that I must believe in. Our theme, as we look at Mark 4, verses 35 to 41, is this. Jesus displays his divine power by calming the, sto the stormy sea. Jesus displays his divine power by calming the stormy sea. We'll see in the first place its fearfulness, that is the fearfulness of the, the, the sheer savagery of the storm. In the second place, the faithfulness of Jesus, Jesus' faithfulness. But as Jesus displays his divine power by calming a stormy sea, we see in the first place the fearfulness of that storm. And so we want to see how, how fearful, how horrific that storm actually was. And we speak, boys and girls, of the, of the fearfulness of the storm uh, because that's the way it's described here in the Bible by Mark. Uh, fearful can mean dreadful. It can be frightening, horrific. It was the kind of storm that made seasoned fishermen, who were, by the way, used to those waters, it made them cry out in great fear. It was violent enough that they truly believed in their hearts at that moment when they went to Jesus to wake him up. They truly believed that they were lost, that they were finished, that they were done for. And it all began with a simple command of Jesus in verse 35, let us cross over to the other side. Now the other side would be, as we learn in chapter 5, verse 1, the, uh, the, 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 the Gadarenes, the country of the Gadarenes, and Jesus had some business, as Lord willing we hope to see next time. Jesus had some business over there as well. There were non-Jewish people living there who also needed the gospel preached to them, and his miracles performed before their eyes. And so... They had to sail eastward across the Sea of Galilee to get to the country of the Gadarenes. And this happened, as Mark tells us, in the late afternoon, perhaps as the sun was already beginning to go down. And Mark records that this happened on the same day. Now, what day was that? Well, if we go back to chapter 4, verse 1, we read this. And again, he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole multitude was on the land facing him. Then he taught them many things by parables, and he continues to teach them. And so the sea here would be the Sea of Galilee. And as we see in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, a huge crowd had gathered to hear Jesus teach. 
And being at the water's edge, Jesus stepped into a boat and kind of made that his pulpit for, for that day. And he sat in it. And it was most likely a fisherman's boat, which could carry somewhere between 12 to 15 men comfortably. And Jesus sat in that boat and he taught the crowds from there. In fact, he taught them all day. And Mark tells us that now, at the command of Jesus, the disciples set sail across the Sea of Galilee, taking him as he was, which simply means in the sitting position in the boat as he was, leaving the crowds behind. And the language seems to indicate that they dismissed the crowds. You guys go home now. We're done for the day. They dismissed the crowds and they set sail across the sea for the other side of the Lake of Galilee. And of course, after teaching all day, Jesus would have been, understandably, extremely tired. He was, of course, let's remember, not only fully divine, but he was fully, completely human. Little wonder, he soon falls asleep in the stern, that is in the front of the boat, on something like a, a sailor's pillow, um, somewhere where they would sit. And uh, by the way, there are allusions here in this, uh, in this account to the Old Testament prophet Jonah, who also fell asleep in the lowest part of the ship, you might remember. And Jonah's ship as well uh, encountered a furious storm. Mark records that things suddenly took a turn for the worst. He says a windstorm, a great windstorm arose. Now, this was not, and I think we know this was, a, we've heard, probably heard sermons on this before or stories about this. This was not an uncommon thing. The Sea of Galilee lies nearly 700 feet below sea level in a basin that is surrounded by hills and very steep mountains on the east side. 30 miles to the northeast, Mount Hermon rises to 9,200 feet above sea level. And according to scholars and people who have studied these things, the interchange between the cold upper air from Mount Hermon and the warm air rising from the Sea of Galilee produces sudden, tempestuous weather conditions in the Sea of Galilee. But what we need to see is that while storms were common in that part of the world, this was no ordinary storm. As we said, this storm was so bad that the men who were used to these waters became terrified for their very lives. Mark calls it a great windstorm. The Greek word is megale, from which we get the English word mega. You know, we say stores, brick says we're having a mega sale. Um, you know, that, that's what the, the, it comes from, the Greek word megale. Uh, it, Mark says that there was a great storm, huge storm. The, the wind was so powerful that it was whipping up and churning up the water, sending huge waves against the side of the boat. The Greek, in fact, says that the waves threw themselves on the boat. And so this was a, a storm of considerable violence. That's the picture that's being painted here for us. The waves were, as it were, thrusting themselves into and onto the boat as if it were alive, as if they were alive, as if, as if they were um, making an effort to sink that boat at all costs. Now, these particular kinds of fishing boats had the reputation of being flooded very easily, and so no surprise, Mark says, that it was already filling. It was already filling up. The point is that it was just a matter of time before they swamped and they sunk to a watery grave. And the rudeness of the words of the disciples to Jesus reflects something of their frustration, of their great fear, of their desperation. They go to him and they say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? In other words, is it no, of no concern to you? Does it mean so little to you that we are about to lose our lives? That, that was the fear and desperation that filled their hearts. And you know, the disciples here remind us of Israel in the wilderness, don't they? We remember how uh, God had brought Israel out of Egypt with a mighty hand, an outstretched arm. He had uh, brought plagues upon Egypt, and he had displayed that he was a God who was able to save them. And then he brought them out, but then they get walled in. The Red Sea is in front of them. The Egyptian army is behind them. And what happens? They begin to cry out and criticize Moses. They say, you brought us out into this wilderness to kill us. And later on, even after God had brought them through that, they would complain about, uh, to God uh, when they were hungry, when they were thirsty, and they, they would say things like, you know, we would have been better off dying in Egypt. At least there we had pots of meat and, and, and lots of bread. But you know, before we judge Israel or the disciples too harshly, 
we have to see that, that we too can often have the same reaction. It doesn't mean that there is no trust in us whatsoever, no faith in us whatsoever. It just means that extreme fear, or when things are out of our control, they can, uh, these things can cause us to cry out even against the God whom we know to be our Savior and our Heavenly Father. There are times in our lives when we find ourselves buffeted by the waves of pain, by grief, by unsurety, when all the safety nets that we have set up for ourselves, all the defenses seem to be useless, and things are out of our control, and we realize that. Suddenly one of our children comes down with a grave illness, or it, maybe it's a personal prolong, prolonged illness, and especially the kind of, that goes on and on, and maybe there's no end in sight. Sometimes it's the, the sudden death of a loved one, financial hardships. Maybe there's a sin in our lives that causes us great frustration because we have been praying and praying and praying and we're not seeing ourselves making the kind of progress that we, we, we think we should be making. Singleness can be hard and very trying. Times of persecution may come. And in our moments of desperation, we can react like the disciples. We can be tempted to think that somehow God is either ignoring our situation or maybe he just can't do anything about it. But then we're reminded of passages like these. And we remember that Jesus never really promised us smooth, continuous sailing and calm waters always. In fact, he said to us things like this. In this world, you will have trouble. He said, if the world hates you, remember that they hated me first. And we remember that our Lord chooses to teach us many precious lessons through affliction. And you see, without the occasional rock and the occasional tidal wave that comes at us in life, we would never really learn how weak we really are in and of ourselves. We would never really learn what it means to pray to God. If God didn't allow and send those tidal waves and storms into our lives, we would remain unpurified in our thoughts, in our emotions. We would never be weaned from the attractions of this world. We would never long for heaven because we would love this world too much. And so true is the saying that when we stand before God someday, after this life, we shall all say, it was good for me that I was afflicted. And we shall thank God for every storm, even the most fearful ones. But thankfully, as we're reminded here, the Lord does not leave us in our misery. As Jesus displays his divine power by calming a stormy sea, we see in the second place his faithfulness. The disciples, as we saw, quickly awake Jesus. And we can picture this. They run to him, their eyes perhaps bugging out in fear, and they're shaking him awake and shouting their accusing question at him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And you know that the Lord Jesus is so patient and so merciful to them, we'd say, was a miracle in itself. Even after all they had seen and heard as they had walked with him, they didn't even have the faith of a mustard seed at this point. How quickly they forgot their master's miracles that he had done before their eyes, his compassion that he had displayed before them so many times in previous days, and they were blinded by their present peril. But amazingly, we see our Lord dealing most gently and tenderly with them. He doesn't chastise them. He doesn't berate them. He doesn't threaten them. You know, think about it. Put yourself in, in, in the Lord's shoes and think about how you or I would react to people in that same kind of situation, that same kind of a accusation. I, I, I know what I would do, and I know what I would say. Maybe you are more sanctified than I, but let, I'm, I'm being honest. If I did that amount of work with people and put so much effort into them and then they turned and accused me like that and made such a, a terrible accusation uh, at that, you know, I would probably say something like this, you know what, I'm going to get you out of this. But as soon as we get to that shore, I want you guys off this boat and out of my life. And I want you out of here. You, 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 you're fired. You're done for. I'm done with you. I've wasted my time with you. And that's a sinful part of me talking, of course. But, uh, you know, and maybe we all would confess, yeah, if, if someone did that to you and, and, and returned wickedness for your goodness, I mean, you'd probably be at least tempted to, to say those kinds of things or something to that effect to them. Not so the Lord Jesus. 
He's very sympathetic to their situation. He's full of tender mercy. We remember here of the words of Psalm 103, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And that's a great comfort to us, isn't it? That the Lord does not deal with us according to our sins or repay them according to our iniquities. He sees our weakness. He is aware of our shortcomings. He knows us inside and out. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows all our defects. He knows the weakness of our faith. He knows the shallowness of our love for Him. He knows how wavering we are in our courage, in our desire to stand for Him in this world. He knows all of this about us. And yet, the Lord, and we can look at this passage and all through the Scriptures, we may uh, confess and know that the Lord will never cast us aside. He bears with us continually. His love for us never changes. He raises us when we fall. He restores us even when we rebel against Him. And we do so every day. His patience surpasses knowledge. And as those who are weak in faith so often, what a blessing to remember how merciful the Lord is toward us. But now comes my favorite part of the whole account, verse 39. Then He arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now, one thing we have to catch, and this is very striking, is that Jesus needs, oh, he does what needs to be done without any effort whatsoever. That's, that's the, the sense we get here in this passage. He does so effortlessly. The word translated rebuked can mean scold or admonish, warn, forbid, it's as if Jesus said to the howling wind, stop it right now. Stop being such a nuisance. That's the sense we get from the language. Picture, for instance, the tone, boys and girls, that mom would use. The elders are coming over tonight for their visit, and so mom has just spent a lot of time cleaning up and straightening up the house, and you're there jumping on the couches, and you're throwing pillows at your sister. Picture the tone she would use when she comes into that room and says, stop it, sit down, be quiet right now. And you know she means business, right? Or how we would scold our dog if, uh, if a guest came over and the dog is jumping on them, and especially if it's the neighbor's cute daughter come by for a visit. I mean, we'd go out there and say, Rover, stop it, bad dog. You know, we, we would uh, talk to them in that tone, and, and Rover knows, yeah, it means business. I better go sit in my corner kind of thing. That's how Jesus talks to the wind and the wave. Now listen as well to a couple of things that we need to, uh, need to point out to you. Uh, Mark, I'm, I'll explain why I read these in a second. Uh, Mark in, uh, in uh, chapter 1, verse 23 to 26, writes this. And this is in the, um, the, uh, the context of the, uh, the, uh, the man with the unclean spirit in the synagogue. And he comes and he cries. In uh, Mark 1, verse 23, he comes and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have you we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. And here in verse 25 we read, But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Note the word rebuke there. And then in uh, Mark 8, verse 33, um, we read, um, Mark 8, verse 33, But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Again, the word rebuked is used there. And in chapter 9, verse 25, uh, we read, When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And I read these because we need to see that there was something else going on here as well. The same verb, translated rebuke, is used in all of these places in the context of Jesus dealing with demonic forces. And so it would seem that Mark is trying to tell us that there was something demonic, there was something devilish about the storm. And that would, <clears throat> that would make sense if we understand that Satan's greatest wish was that our salvation would never be accomplished. My little ones on Tuesday nights, my youngest class, we're learning about the line of promise. And that is the continuous line of sons throughout Old Testament history from whom Jesus would eventually be born. So we say Adam had a son um, named, uh, named Abel, and then Cain killed Abel, and God gave him another son named Seth, and then Seth had a son, and, and he had a son, and he had a son, and he had a son, and all the way down history, 
Jesus was finally born. That's a line of promise. And we're learning about that. And we're also seeing that Satan did everything that he could to stop that line, to break that line so that Jesus would not come in the wor- into the world. Satan did not want our salvation. He did not want us to be saved. And here again was another attempt to destroy Jesus and indeed the church in its infancy in that boat with a storm. But we see again the divine power of Jesus over the elements of nature. Jesus, Lord and master of his creation, he rebukes the wind and he says to the waves, peace, be still. Literally, be silent. He silences the wind. He brings that situation under control as easily as mom would with one look. You know, sometimes, you know, again, the elders come over, and mom has set out a tray of cookies, boys and girls, and we're kind of fighting with our sister. I want the big one, I want the big one. And mom kind of gives us one of these looks, and right away, no, I don't even want a cookie. You know, we know exactly what that look means. Um, in fact, I should go to bed right now and say my prayers. You know, we know what that, that look means when mom shoots it at us. Sometimes my wife would call me Mitchell at home. You know, usually she has a little nickname for me. Sometimes she calls me Mitch. But when she says Mitchell... I know I'm in, you know, there's a, we're in a different zone where uh, things have gotten really serious. Usually, usually we can even tell by dad's tone, um, the tone of his voice, that he means move now. No, no arguing. I don't want to hear a word immediately. Jesus had that power. And I want us to see that. Jesus had that power over the wind and the waves. And we read that when Jesus commanded the wind and the waves, that the wind ceased and there was great calm. And we have to believe that this happened immediately, instantly, or the disciples would not have been so shocked. One minute, the wind is howling, clothes are flapping in the the powerful breeze, the boat is going up and down, crashing back into the waves, the next second, calm as a bathtub. Jesus possessed such authority over the forces of nature that when he commanded, they listened. And they listened instantly. Not to belabor the analogy, but sometimes we can't even get our own children to listen that fast. But Jesus had that power over the elements of nature. Another thing we have to see is that Mark mentions that there was a great calm. Before, there was a great windstorm. Again, the same word, mega. Um, There was a mega windstorm. Now there was a mega calm, a great calm. The calm, in other words, was noticeable. It could be felt It seems to suggest that this calmness exceeded the normal calmness of the Sea of Galilee. With a few words, Jesus brought tranquility where there was turbulence. He brought order where there was chaos. And this is where Jesus, of course, far exceeds the Old Testament prophet Noah. How did Noah, or how was the sea calmed in the day of Jonah, I should say. Uh, How was the sea calmed in the days of Jonah? He was thrown in to the sea. Jesus calmed it with just a command. And by doing this, Jesus showed us once again that he was divine. He was God. He possessed power that only God possesses. And he does what only God could do. In Psalm 65, verse 7, David confesses the Lord as the one who stills the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves. In Psalm 89, verse 9, we read of God who rules the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. In Psalm 107, verse 29, we hear this of God. He calms the storm so that its waves are still. This is what Israel confessed of their God throughout their history. And now that God had appeared and walked among them. Jesus displayed his divinity when he calmed the stormy sea. And then he uses this as a teaching moment as well. In verse 40, he turns to them and he says, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Literally in the Greek it says, not yet you have faith. After all they had seen and heard from him, they had accused him of not caring about about them. And they had abandoned themselves to despair. And again, brothers and sisters, we're not all that different, are we? How many times does the Lord not show us over and over again that he is concerned for us? that he has control of our lives, that he is able to bring us through whatever difficulties that we are going through, and then something happens again, and we are back to the same worry and stress, and we expect the worst to happen. But notice the reaction of of the disciples in verse 41. 
And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, it's amazing how careless people can talk about God and the kinds of ideas that, that you hear about or that goes on in people's heads these days about who God is, how, how very carelessly they can talk about God. I was a, many, many years ago, I was, I was at a funeral, and they had an open mic, and so anybody could come up and, and say what they wanted to say, say a few words. Um, and there was one man who got up, and, and obviously in, in great grief, he said into the microphone, he said, you know, I want to say one thing. When I get to heaven... I'm going to have a few questions for God. And one of the questions I'm going to have for him is, why did you take my cousin so young? And, you know, given that, uh, you know, there was great grief in his heart. But, you know, the Bible certainly would discourage that kind of a talking to God or talking about God. And it reminds us here in a passage such as, such as this, that the presence of God's holiness is more frightening to sinful humans than even the most destructive of natural disasters. God's nearness in Jesus in that boat was Deeply unsettling, alarming, even terrifying. But congregation, this is the God we need to save us. Not one that we can control, not one that we can even fully understand, and certainly not a God that we make, that we create in our image. We need a God who is full in majesty and glory and power, who is sovereign over all creation, a God before whom we may stand amazed and awed. Jesus, in that boat, on that stormy evening, unveiled his divinity. He revealed that he was not merely a gifted speaker, or he was not merely endowed with exceptional gifts. He, he revealed that he was God himself. And he calls us this morning, once again, to put away fear and place our faith in him. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for these amazing things that we have recorded for us in the Holy Scriptures. Thank you that in the fullness of time, God became man and walked among us, and that our Lord Jesus displayed his divinity again and again to teach us that he is a God whom we must and may believe in, that we, should, we can trust in him, that he is a Savior above all other saviors. We pray that we may truly rejoice in, we, in the Savior that you have provided who is perfect in every way and who, being divine, has left nothing undone. We may trust in him and know that through all the challenges of our lives, the ups and downs that we face, the storms of our lives, that we may know that he remains the same today, tomorrow, and forever, and he remains powerful over sin and death. Bless us that we may believe more and more that we may set aside fear, that we may place faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name alone. Amen. Number 460.